about that because I think we're going to learn a lot today. Um, I hope you're ready to take notes. Hey, right. I think uh, the presentation is going to be of great interest to a lot of us. Wonderful seeing you again. Well, listen, uh, how many of you are new here for the first time? One, two, three, four, five. All right. Six back there. Oh, very good. Well, welcome to everyone that's new. And I want to tell you a little bit about what 40 plus is so that you can put um, us to work on your behalf, okay? And, and learn a little bit about how we can help you. 40 plus is an all volunteer nonprofit organization. We've existed here in DC since 1953. Now you can imagine this is all volunteer and we're going on 65 years. Tell me if that isn't really a gem, a unique, unique uh, organization. We're peers helping peers. Peers that go through a core course that we have on uh, career transition skills. Once you graduate from the course, you then become one of our members and one of the uh, people that hopefully will give back to the organization and keep it going. And this is a two-way street, because even though you volunteer, it keeps you active and engaged and getting to know new people. So we're going to be talking about volunteerism as well in one of uh, these meetings, because it really helps everyone when you volunteer and you get to know new people and you stay active. So in any case, 40 Plus was created in 1950, 1939, originally in New York, by titans of industry. Who knows about Tom Watson? Who is Tom Watson? No one here knows? IBM. IBM, IBM founder of IBM. Uh, J.C. Penney of J.C. Penney Retailing. Um, uh, Norman Vincent Peel, The Power of Positive Thinking. Uh, the author of that book, and as well, you might know um, Arthur Godfrey, who was a titan of entertainment in the entertainment industry. So one of the things that came out of that was that after the Depression, people who experienced professionals, like we are, were trying to get back into the workforce, and these titans of industry said, hey, you, these people have a lot of experience, a lot to offer. They have expertise. Let's help them through uh, 40 plus. And so uh, it took off both in New York and then in 1953 here in DC. And we have many success stories where we can tell you people have been able to put to good use the skills that we teach and have been able to get jobs. Um, quite soon after they took the course. Sometimes we have some success stories where they haven't even finished the course and they already got a job. So um, I, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about 40 plus and now we're going to talk about the our presenter today. Um, to talk to you about it is Ken Shotman who is our Director of Partnership and Program. Thank you, Gerald. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate those who are returning, and of course, as well as our new guests. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to tell you a little bit about a couple of other partner events. Uh, Gerald mentioned that I'm, I handle that as well, because we believe that as a nonprofit here at the Foundation Center, that's what they teach all the time, is that for small nonprofit organizations, it's impossible to go it alone. So 40 Plus is very proud of the partnerships we are building with allied organizations throughout the area. And two of them have events coming up in the next couple of weeks that I wanted to tell you a little bit about. Uh, our good friends at JCA, which is the Jewish Council on the Aging, uh, has their May event coming up May 11, so next Saturday, uh, not this coming Saturday, but the week after, out in Fairfax. Uh, they call it the Senior Expo, but it really is a terrific event, not only for networking, for job opportunities, and also for to learn more about community resources. So, uh, you might have seen the slide in the presentation earlier. There's a link to the JCA event on, on our page as well. It's entirely free uh, for individuals to attend. Another event that we're pleased to support is something called the 2017 Boom Conference. So for anyone who has that, that voice in the back of their mind talking about, you know, I really should be my own business, or I really can do this on my own, this could be a terrific resource. Uh, one of our very popular speakers, Angela Heath, 
He's on the steering committee for this event. It's going to take place on Thursday, May 18th. Uh, at the Silver Spring Civic Center, right there near the Metro in Silver Spring, from 8.30 to 4. And while there is a standard registration fee for this event, as a, as a participant here with 40 Plus, you have the opportunity to attend for free. Uh, our, our supporters at AARP are providing scholarships, so you can find out more about that event uh, on the website. There are some cards uh, on the table as well. And then finally, I want to tell you about a special event we have here, here at 40 Plus, uh, our Networking with Purpose event for May. Networking with Purpose are our evening events, which we hold once a month, not only to engage folks who are in a transition, but those who may be working or otherwise busy during the day to help them connect with other people, consider more about, learn more about potential transitions. And the May 11 program uh, in the evening, seven o'clock, right here in this room, uh, is gonna feature a friend and colleague of mine, Vinay Kumar, uh, Vinay is a, the, a consultant with an organization called Tioco, which is a global innovation advising organization. Uh, Vinay has worked with companies and individuals around the world to help them unlock their creative potential through harnessing the diversity and capabilities of their team. Uh, he's the author of two books. He's going to talk about his most recent one on creating excellence and breakthrough results in your leadership style. We're very pleased to have Vinay with us. Uh, registration for that program is just $10. We have a networking function beforehand and afterwards. Uh, and again, I think today is going to have some terrific points to make. So that's May 11th right here at 40 plus. So enough of the announcements. Let's get on with the show. Um, so I'm very happy to have our my friend uh, and colleague, uh, Kat, Kathy Gavatz is with us today. Uh, Kathy has over 20 years of experience developing and implementing solutions to homelessness and poverty. In San Francisco, she was the executive director of Compass Family Services, a large nonprofit that provides a comprehensive range of services for homeless and very low income families. In Norfolk, Virginia, she was the founder and executive director of Virginia Social Ventures, which operated the job training, pro, job training enterprise Spotlight Books. Kathy has served as an Atlantic Fellow at Oxford University, a staff major of regional commission, and is the author of the book Crime in the Public Mind. She has a bachelor's degree in sociology from UC Berkeley and a PhD in politics from Princeton. She's currently on the board of the Center for Nonprofit Advancement here in Washington. As Gerald mentioned, 40 Plus has just become a member of the center. And as a member of this, as 40 Plus is a member, our members have access to special uh, opportunities for their training programs as well. We can tell you more about that later. Kathy is also an experienced interim executive director. She led the Food Bank of Southeastern Virginia to the transition following the departure of its founding executive director, working with the board as an organization with development issues and facilitating the search for its next leader. We're very proud to have Kathy here with us today. Kathy, good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Raisin Maven, I thought that was, that was great marketing, kind of that, I remember that tagline, I've forgotten her name, but I but, uh, also noticed at the time that sitting over there off the screen, so this is what you can do this just a little quicker here on this side. So I'm going to start out by saying that I have been a feminist since before I knew what the word meant, that as a five or six or seven year old, looking back, I can see experiences that I had uh, world feminism, you know, I don't know what to call them. And uh, it's nice to be in a crowd like this of over 40 people. I just turned 60, um, or we can tell some of those stories and maybe you would actually know what I meant. So the first one I think of is going with my mother to the Capwell's department store in Oakland, California. And she had one of these old fashioned charger plates in a little leather pouch. It was metal, you know, and the, the cashier had to go ka chunk with it. And I said, Mrs. John E. Taylor. I said, who's that? And she said, that's me, Thelma Taylor. And I was like, what? Why don't you get your own name on your charger plate? And then in the church directory, the church, lots of names, lots of married couples, all Mr. and Mrs. Mm -hmm. in those days. But it would be Mr. and Mrs. Ken Shopman, parentheses, Merle. Parentheses. <laughs> you know, it's like I might have been seven years old, but I knew 
I was not a parenthesis. <laughs> and I knew these women. They were not parentheses. Why were my mother's good friends parentheses? Why was my mother a parentheses? And then, to make it even more personal, um, my mother was Thelma Taylor when she was born. And my father was John Taylor when he was born. Oh, wow. And I, uh, since we're talking about feminism, I'm going to say I am Kathy Taylor Gobbett, not Kathy Gobbett. And my husband is her Taylor Gobbett. Go back to my parents and, and be a little girl. Thelma Taylor married John Taylor. So she got to stay Taylor. <laughs> but I gradually realized that all the other women, especially we're talking the early 60s then, they had to give up their name, no choice involved. So that just didn't seem fair to me. And in fact, I remember going through the Oakland phone book, looking to see how many tailors there were. This was my like six-year-old version of this, that at least if I could find there were enough tailors, maybe I could do what my mother did. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we've grown as beyond that now. But this, these little stories are just to tell you how very important feminism, which just means everybody being able to reach their potential, has always been. So when uh, Lean In came out, and I had a chance to read that book, I just loved it, and was so excited about it. And um, people who know me know I'm pretty skinny. Uh, I'm a very, very frugal person. I don't part with it all or easily. But I went out and bought extra hard copies, like three, four, five extra hardback copies of this book to send to my friends. Mm -hmm. That's how excited I was about it. And then uh, you know, after that, um, uh, Anne Marie Slaughter wrote the article about whether or not we had it all in the Atlantic, and her book came out. Uh, you know, we heard about commencement speeches and TED Talks, and the media, of course, wanted to make us think that this was like a cat fight. You know, they liked that. <coughs> but um, to me, these ideas that they have, this is why they now, um, were actually very complementary, um, and and I knew these two women as Maybe you could just give me a show of hands. How many of you have read either one of these books? Okay, a few. How many of you have uh, read an article or heard a TED talk or uh, you know had any previous exposure to a shorter, shorter work? Okay, we get a few more. Anybody ever heard either of them speak? Um, so so Slaughter was here at the, the book festival. That was a wonderful opportunity. So some people heard her or or Shel Sandberg in other places. Wonderful. So we've had some exposure in, in some parts. Um, so I wanted to start with two quotes um, that that make the point that um, these two women are not far apart. Um, Sandberg, of course, emphasizes individual change. What we can do on our own. And what's important for us to do. And uh, slaughter emphasizes societal change. But a really critical thing to emphasize uh, is that all of them talk about what men and women can do, women and men. So uh, this is you know, early in Sandberg's book. A truly equal world would be one where women ran half our countries and companies, and men ran half our homes. And of course, we can quibble on, I think she'd probably agree also, that it doesn't have to be one or the other necessarily. We can cooperate 50 50 on our homes and we can cooperate and collaborate in the workplace. But the, you know, this is a get it right out there state. And then slaughter, most of the pervasive gender inequalities in our society for both men and women cannot be fixed unless men have the same range of choices with respect to mixing caregiving and breadwinning that women do. And then later she hits us. The next phase of the women's movement is a men's movement. So th this is just to show how close they are in a lot of ways, even though they emphasize the different roads you might take to get there. And I'm really glad to see some men do not get scared off uh, from the time. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, So I thought because we couldn't be sure how many people might have read the books, heard of these women, that we'd start just with some basics. And it's, you know, it's hard to boil a, a whole book down to um, its, its uh, basic points, but um, Lean In, I think, comes, is a little less complex 
and it's pretty easy to get three broad points. Uh, Slaughter and Unfinished Business is a very complex and broad book, but I tried to take that into three points also. And then we can talk about um, how does this apply to the second half uh, of our working lives. Uh, it, it's true that especially Cheryl Sandberg's book is, is uh, focused a lot on uh, helping w younger women to think about doing things a little differently than she might have done or she's seen other people doing. But there's a lot of wisdom, I think, in these books, too, for the second half, particularly in Slaughter's work. And um, I hope we'll have time. We'll keep, uh, you said we need to finish by 11.15, right? Let's, uh, we'll try to keep an eye on the clock, but we'll try to break up a little bit and talk one on one in some, um, some tiny groups of two also. So um, let's start with this, the leadership ambition gap. That's our first big um, point. And uh, if you, uh, you might see my, my button, the ban bossy campaign. Um, <laughs> How many of you were ever called bossy when you were kids? Um, ring any bells? You know, that, that that just resonated all over the place for me. And uh, to hear her say that um, when we talk about boys differently than we talk about girls, that um, when a boy stands up and is bossy, we think of it as you know assertive leadership skills in a fine young man at eight or nine. But um, when a young girl does the same thing, we may say, um, you know, are you sure you're being appropriate to be you know, a little bossy there? So the, the point of that and the campaign that she started through the WeIn.org website is for us just to think, um, you know, when, when we're looking at a young girl and um, critiquing her behavior, what would we say to a boy doing the same thing? And, and, and sure, we can all look back at our childhoods and, I think of times when I really was bossy, actually, <coughs> but um, I was called that many times when a boy was not a, so that's important. And then when we grow up, it often doesn't get any different. Um, those of us who are assertive and stand up and move into leadership roles and speak up for ourselves, hard charging women, uh, we violate unwritten social rules. And the, the uh, thing that, that brought her to focus on these in her right book the uh, attrition rate in work and full-time work among highly trained women, uh, going into government, the corporate world, Silicon Valley, all the sectors where she was, and seeing women who had um, high-level degrees, MBAs, and other professional training just disappear. As she rose, people she'd come in with uh, just were fading away. Uh, and with the, the why of it perhaps is addressed a lot in Slaughter's book, but uh, and noticing this in her life, and then uh, going to the data and seeing that there really is a very significant attrition rate uh, from the big business schools and other professional schools. Uh, the men keep working, and the men keep working full time. Women in large numbers drop back. Um, all right. Um, the, the next thing is uh, the point itself lean in. Um, this actually mean? Uh, it's interesting she doesn't ever really define it. <laughs> um, but it seems to be a, a, a physical thing, you know, that, that we do a lot of falling back and holding our hands down and kicking ourselves away. And so this physical metaphor of putting yourself forward um, comes out for the book uh, to stop underestimating yourself. That, that women do this more than men do. Everybody underestimates themselves. And uh, to a group of people who are in career transition looking for jobs, I think you know, we're, we're even more focused probably than other people on how we do this. And men do it too. But women just do it more. Uh, so she wants us to be ambitious. She wants us to sit at the table. So um, there's a story in the book about how there was a uh, a gathering with a big uh, Politico from here in Washington in, um, in Google or Facebook or one of the companies she was working at, uh, you know, secretary of something. And he comes in and he brings his team for uh, you know, high-powered women who are major deputies to the secretary of whatever. And uh, Silicon Valley CEOs and so forth are invited to the chit-chat with the secretary. And they all go around the room, they get their nibbles and so forth, and then she invites them to sit down at what must have been an enormous boardroom table. 
and the four women all sat on the side. And there were plenty of seats at the board table, so she invited them to come and join the meeting. And every one of them said, no, no, we're fine, we're wrong. And as she, as she described it in the book, after the meeting, she went over and talked to them about um, what they had done to themselves, what they had done to the image of women in the world. I'm traveling a little bit through them, which doesn't describe the conversation in detail, and they, they agreed that they actually had, had high-level jobs in whatever department this was, and that, that was appropriate. But um, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can probably all think of some times when we have done that uh, for different reasons. I was impressed when you raised your hand as a new person here, and you were the only person sitting in the front row. That's fantastic. Um, and, and she talks also about raising your hand and keeping your hand up. Uh, that, uh, again, she, someone came to her and um, explained how, despite her own feminist principles, uh, what the woman had learned most from her talk was never put your hand down because she had said she would take two more questions and, you know, six hands were up or whatever, and she took two. And then this woman had a question still, but she put her hand out, as did every woman in the room. But some of the men kept their hands up, and Cheryl Sandberg went right on answering questions, even though she only, she said she would only take two. And so this woman came to her and said, what I learned from your talk is, you keep your hand up. And, you know, there's a limit to this, of course, but, um, so, so lean in is physical. Get ourselves out there, as, as well as emotional. And, and then the last part, um, a sad part now in hindsight, because um, she has suffered a very tragic sudden death of her husband two years ago, um, and, and, and writes in her brand new book, Option D, which I'm only partway through now, about how this has caused her to reflect much more on single parenting and how very difficult it is even for someone with a lot of money, especially when you don't um, Still, to go back, this is, I think, one of her largest points in her original book, make your partner a real partner, and that this decision, uh, it's completely okay to decide you don't want a partner. You may be in a place in life where that opportunity doesn't come to you. But if it does, and, and Slaughter says this about other things too, you, know, you, you may not have choice, but if you have a choice, do this. And this is Sandberg saying, if you have a choice, think about who, whether or not a partner and who that is, that that is your most important career decision. And she highlights that by uh, talking about who, this, uh, who the female CEOs of the top like four to 500 countries, uh, companies are, very few women. And then we would think, oh, those are, like 200 years ago, you know, when we read the obituaries of uh, major scientists, women who are 85 or 100 now, it's, you know, it's so sad uh, so often to see no survivors, you know, they, they, they had to give their whole lives for science or whatever their career was. This is not true now. The women who have made it to the tops of these companies, major five, Fortune 500 companies, almost without exception, she said, are married, and the thing is they have husbands who have been willing to every step of the way to support their career, uh, and that that is critical. And so here's where she begins to speak to men that uh, we need you to lean in and be as vicious as that. So I'm going to ask you to lean in a little bit here. Uh, it's something I have always been had a person to about is rearranging the room. And so sometimes I might do that early on, but I thought I would wait um, and just to see how it fell out and let them laugh. Let us do it now. You know, this room is like nicely balanced in some ways, but um, you know, probably there's several things happening here. Some people came new and they didn't know anybody, and uh, some people just like the back of the room better than the front of the room, and so forth. But I'm asking you to pick yourself up and think about that we're going to um, divide up by twos. Um, so sit next to somebody, but sit next to somebody you've never talked to before. And maybe you want to leave one seat. There's enough, enough space here to leave a one seat gap so that your conversations are a little private. And I want the back three rows, except for our uh, helper, I forgot. Jim. Joe. Jim? Jim. 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 Thank you, Jim. Uh, I want the back three rows to be empty. Uh, 
So let's put us all in the first five rows here now. And, and um, as you do that, let's think about you know, what kind of feel. Yeah.
or not to, to go on vacation and taking an email with them or those kinds of things. So highly paid work is tied to email around the clock. And then uh, what is maybe even a little newer, the worst paid workers uh, tied not to email but to the sense of I gave you a job, you're working in my store or my um, fast food place or whatever, and you are, you're actually available in day for whatever shift I want you for, and you might think it was a full-time job, but they are only giving me 15 hours this week, but, but you have to be at my beck and call, and you have to have your child care and your elder care arranged to be at my beck and call. So that these are new, new things, <coughs> not, um, not old ones. And then what she'd like our society to do is create a new infrastructure of care. And uh, clear with us that our old infrastructure of care was women at home. Uh, that, that was the old infrastructure you put it in one word. Uh, the new one, she had an even longer list of this in the book, but the, the key points, uh, really quality, affordable child care and elder care, you know, important for us at this point, better pay and training for paid caregivers, financial and social support, uh, honoring and not stigmatizing single parents, paid family medical leave for women and men, and more legal protections for part-time and flexible workers. She actually sees a lot of hope in the gig economy because of the flexibility that this provides and the way it um, intersects very well with care, but um, because benefits and so forth are not um, offered in the independent contractor relationship, uh, this is something that we as a society probably have to address. If we, we want to have the flexibility that comes with then we have to provide the support system underneath. All right, so let's switch to the second half. You know, what, why did it seem like this might be an interesting thing to talk about here? I, you know, I'm jazzed up about these books. I'll go talk about them anywhere. I started out thinking, uh, because of my own uh, involvement in all, all my lifetime work in the nonprofit sector, about these books um, focusing primarily on the more hard-charging worlds of government and nonprofits, but how there were a lot of lessons for the nonprofit sector. But when Ken invited me to talk here, I thought, all right, I'm already thinking about this. And I think even though a lot of people think even are books for the young, I think there's a, there's a lot in them for this stage of life, too. So um, I, I wanted to call our attention to think about the kinds of job search and career issues that come after 40 that um, we then might go back to the books and think, well, what, what do these women have to say? They're the block thinkers. So the first is actual legal age discrimination. And then the fact that um, some of us are in the sandwich situation. I, I consider myself out of that now. My children are both past college and uh, into jobs. But um, I imagine there are those of you here in the sandwich generation who have both minor children and parents who need your help. And, and then, so once we go out the other side, then uh, our parents or other elder relatives, um, they need our help. And so um, we have care issues, lots of them in the after 40. Um, and, and people have children, younger and younger. So there are many people in this room who have little tiny kids. Is that true of anyone? I would like to ask about how come racial discrimination is done? That's good. Yeah. When I got to the bottom of this, I was going to ask you folks what was missing from it. So we can add that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think that that um, increases with age? Yes.
about Madden. We might also have greater financial commitments than in use. Um, some of them genuine commitments, sometimes we just get used to thinking like it's nice to have a little more money than when we were 21, but that can be an issue. And fear. Um, I'm too old for this. It's too late to do that for other years. What if I fail? Yeah, what if I fail? What if I flatter my face? Overqualified. Yeah? Okay. So we're going to add in increased racial discrimination as we age, people uh, perceiving us as overqualified, even if it's a good experience. What else is we going to add to this list? Having to report to people who are younger and less experienced than you are. There you go. All right. Uh, people might not like this, but I teach it <laughs> in higher ed. Um, the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. For the Gen X and the baby boomers, if you have kids, you don't earn as much money as men. The millennials, though, are not having kids. The percentage is going down. They're becoming leaders. They're earning as, as much as men. Is that going to change? Because you're saying we should become even. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to hear that, but I'm just wondering if that's part of the problem. The glass ceiling is still around. Mm -hmm. It's still complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to change that, mm -hmm. depending on your age. Well, we can talk about that more. All right, so let's go on then. Because any other barriers you I, want to put in? I didn't know that that was okay. risk taking. Uh -huh. And so I think as you get older, you tend to want to take less risk, mm -hmm. relocating across the country, taking right. a job. That, uh -huh. Because I think risk taking is a part of that as well. Okay. All right, good. So we've, we've added <coughs> several things. What might have been smart if I've written them down over there. Um, yeah, as we go through the, the lessons we can draw from these books, if you see some of these other points that I wasn't focusing on as much uh, in advance, feel free to chime in and say, hey, you know, that really ties for that. All right, so let's first start just with one topic where the two of them absolutely agree and talk about the same thing. Sam Burr says she's learned done is better than perfect. And she learned this as she got older. And Slaughter says, no more time macho. And uh, so what you mean by time macho is the relentless competition to work harder, later, and longer. So the, you know, these are two very hardworking women who have uh, you know, paid their dues in every way and lived by the, the men's world, world rules and risen to the top. But they learned the lesson. Sleep. Uh, take your vacation. And that working less is actually more productive. And there's a lot of data to back this up. Uh, you, know, you don't have to do anything more than read the New York Times on a regular basis to see over and over again the studies, of course, about sleep, that if, if there are a few people who are the outliers, you can get by on four hours. But most of us are not them. We, we need our seven to eight hours to function well, to have our brains work, and that uh, Forcing ourselves from email, especially when we're on our vacation, that our organizations will not fall apart. We will still be valued when we come back and we return healthier and more productive. And the same also for uh, not reading email after hours. You know, we still have folks. If the building burns down, they will call us. And we can set cutoff times where uh, after X hour, well, depending on the job, five o'clock for one hour, one job, five thirty-six, uh, seven, whatever your hour is. But I would tell you, it's not ten p.m. Um, that you do not need to read the email, and you will be happier, healthier, and the world will go on, and they will still love you. Um, and the studies back that up, and these two women both uh, on the same. <laughs> so, and, and Sandberg especially says uh, that that she wants us to stand up. And, and do that to challenge the, the culture of the 24 7 world. And uh, that's those of us who are over 40 who are more likely to be in leadership positions can do that. Yeah. How do you challenge something when the culture of the institution is that you have to do the emails, you have to be accessible, you have to be part of the, these corporations? So these CEOs can make billions of dollars, run 24 hours a day, not like in the old days where they didn't, because now you have the technology where you're going to find these people. 
who are going to respond, and if you're not responding, you're not seen as a cooperative employee. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you... I mean, how does she address that? Sandberg addresses it more about women and then once they're in leadership positions, standing up for that. If your question is more how some But if we have women in these leadership positions and they're not standing up for it because they know that the guy down the street could take their, their corner office. And mm -hmm. so they some of these women are the most pushiest ones in regards to your elder care or taking time off and coming back to work. Mm -hmm. So I mean it's it sounds nice and I'm not knocking it. I wish I worked in a place that was like that. You know, where I mean, we had a we had a um, executive vice president who had cancer and he had to get blood transfusions and people would donate blood to him every every Friday and he was coming to work mm -hmm. and everyone used him as an example mm -hmm. as someone you know who thought so highly of the company that mm -hmm. he would be there yeah you know but I, I don't see where these women are taking the risk which goes back to that lady's statement about taking risks to move across the country or mm -hmm. to be in an environment that does become slightly toxic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is not easy. And, and I'm not speaking for what Cheryl Amber or Amory Slaughter mm -hmm. should say here because I don't think they answered your question in detail. So I guess I'll just speak for myself. And I do want to acknowledge that the organizations I've led have been nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. and I have never worked in the corporate world. So my suggestion is people always respond better when you don't embarrass them in a uh, in a So that if, if something's important to you like that and you feel like you have the data behind it, I first talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, in a private place to the person in that position to make that decision. And I come armed with the studies. Um, and you know, make it very clear it's not personal and it's not about you as an individual, it's about the health of the, the organization and the people who work in it. And if I didn't get anywhere with that, I might start talking to Mike, and they got to even do this in advance, talk to my coworkers, and uh, make sure they were aware of the data and the information about this, and uh, encourage them to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. And then bring it into the group when there's enough people who know who's going to be supported. Hopefully you can get some support from your supervisor from the one-on-one -on -one conversation, but if you can't, uh, you know, before you put them on the spot, you know, you make sure you have other people who are speaking up also. And you may not win. We don't always win these battles. Um, and and as, you, as you rightly pointed out, some workplaces are a lot tougher on this. Um, we we'll talk a little bit in another section about some of the companies that are starting to make some changes. And I, I think it's scary to think about being job searchers or people in transition and thinking about those things because we feel like supplicants. Um, but it's a low employment rate. There's particularly the lowest employment rate for professionals and highly educated people, they need us. Um, and at the time when we interview for jobs, this is when organizations find out what people want um, in, in the workplace, what's important to them. So those are still fair times to ask questions about their kind of leave and policies of this sort. We'll talk about it a little bit more again. Um, and I, and it's so hard not to think of ourselves as people with no power when we're in those positions, but we do have some as a, as a group of people that they need. Still okay to ask. You know, um, you know, as being a consultant who <laughs> go to different clients in different environments, I find that what she's saying in that book, it applies in certain environments, to her point, and in other environments, it's, it's like useless. Because if you do speak up, you're gonna get fired because nowadays it's like, you know, hey, this is the way it is, take it or leave it, you mm -hmm. know. In other environments, I think um, the government and some of the, you know, more healthcare, some of these environments that maybe it's not as much, uh, where people have been around longer, longer, I found, like the energy and like that, they, you'll find more people, they have that synergy like you. But in high tech, like I am in IT, nah. No, we work 24 by seven. You don't want to work 24 by seven. You need to find a job or another profession. I mean, that's, that's just, it's, it's all through all the industries. Mm -hmm. And, but I have found that if you're in different roles in those other industries I just met, you'll find more synergy of people um, that you can have that conversation with. But most of the clients I went into, I couldn't dare for you to do things mm -hmm. because I would get fired instantly on the consultant. Then talk about some of the 
some impossible things. They may not always work, but we try. And the more we do together, the more they are applicable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the first is to challenge yourself. Um, women can be more likely to take on challenging tasks and stretch assignments. Uh, we're, we're more vulnerable than men to imposter syndrome. You know what that means? When we may have all the qualifications for something, but we still think, ah, oh, I really shouldn't be here. You know, I haven't done that before, or that person, you know, you're, you're probably better than you should be up here speaking. You know, why didn't they invite you? You know, I haven't done this in a while. Um, and so there are all kinds of places in life where we can think of ourselves as imposters. And um, another exciting uh, woman leader, Amy Cuddy, the social psychologist uh, with power posing. I mean, have you read about that? And the Wonder Woman poses and so forth. You can come back to it at the end of others haven't. She reminds us that from all the feedback she's gotten from her uh, very famous TED that talks and so forth, that men are also extremely vulnerable to uh, imposter syndrome. But apparently, statistically, not as much as women. So um, we, we do this to ourselves. Uh, we're, we're likely to <coughs> underestimate ourselves and more likely underestimate ourselves as men. And when we think about having the skills for a new role, um, men are just more likely to step up to the plate. Uh, it's a really fascinating study, uh, the 100% versus the 60%. So if there's a job and it's got uh, eight qualifications, uh, let's make it 10, uh, 10 qualifications, men apparently will apply for that job if they think they have 60% of the qualifications. And women won't apply for that job unless they think they have 100% of the qualifications. So uh, you know, this, this underestimating ourselves, this selling ourselves short and not stepping up to the plate uh, really gets us. And um, you know, when we're out of the work world and feeling some of these things that we talked about that are the barriers for the report, um, it can get us more. I, personally, I don't, I don't feel like I felt the imposter syndrome much when I was a young woman. But I, I have felt it in uh, the last decade in career transition more. Like, uh, you know, should be somebody else, not me. And it's very easy to come back. So uh, Cheryl Sandberg would say we need to do what she ultimately had to do for herself. That she was very timid about many things earlier in her life. That she, she felt every test she was going to take that she was going to fail it. And uh, that she was not up to many challenges. But she kept acing the tests, and she kept getting the jobs, and ultimately she realized long before writing the book that she had to challenge this distorted internal um, vision of herself. And this again ties to uh, Cuddy and some of the other social psychologists. Fake it till you make it, but as Cuddy would say, or, or say remember, fake it till you feel it, that if you just keep doing it, eventually it will feel normal, and other people don't. And, and so her, her first point for those of us over 40, I think, is just go for it. That um, we may be risk averse and, and, and more so, absolutely, uh, have more to lose or we feel it more. But uh, we learn by doing new things, and that's just as true as we get older. So you're saying just apply for those jobs, just, just step out of your element and do it anyway? Right. Is, that, is that what she's trying to say? Yes, absolutely. Because I've heard that statistic and, that you said. Yeah. yeah and remember that he's going to apply for it, even yeah, though exactly. he, he thinks he's only got 60%, and you know, you probably got 85, and I don't know anything about him personally, but um, yeah, I think that's a wake-up call for us. Plus, I understand that a job description a lot of times is a menu of uh, the best of all worlds, and people know that perhaps not one person would fill everything, so it's always a percentage. Yeah, and the job job description is aspirational, exactly. and we you know we can be accused of being overqualified. Whoever said that, but we can also think of it as transferable skills and experiences, even if we haven't done exactly the same thing. I know sometimes it can be challenging to to be convincing to people of that, but uh, if it's something that we want to do, then to remember other people are doing it and blasting ahead of us with less, um, perhaps because they're personalities are wired differently, or they grew up boys. And it can be a good thing or a bad thing. You know, a lot of the algorithms used when you're trying to apply for a job at a hiring menu, if they don't have the right words, both get kicked out, or both get kicked in. So I think it can be a leveling, and then there's a challenge 
one of our clients. So I've heard that. Mm -hmm. All right. Then she would also like us to uh, think about finding our own path and, and focuses on uh, these changes that uh, Slaughter also emphasizes. It is not, it's not to uh, lead to be the career ladder anymore where you work for one place and you go up in four years in one um, company. So that especially for those of us who are job seekers, career switchers, and people taking time out, um, it's really helpful to think about you know, how, do you, how do you handle a jungle gym rather than a ladder. Some people want to go to the top, but there's a whole lot of different ways to get there. Some people don't want to go to the top. You don't all have that personality or desire. There, there are ways in and out and around. And the, the, the average American now holds many, many jobs. Well, that also very important to us remember when we don't have a job, that people just don't keep the same job their whole career. This is normal um, now. And that there's many ways of climbing or going around. So she would urge us to uh, have a long-term group not, you know, know what you really want, have your own aspirational sense for yourself, but to have an 18-month plan about the piece of the jungle gym that uh, you, you're trying to get on now, whether you're in transition or whether things you want to achieve in your job. And uh, you know, some of them are really tough. We're going to get knocked down and fall, fall and skin our knees on this time. Um, to be open to risk, we talked about that. And um, that the most important criteria for selecting a new job is potential for growth. Now, of course, potential for our own growth, is that, that, that's very important too. But what she's talking about here is potential for growth of the company or organization. And uh, she tells a story about debating um, whether Google or Facebook, I forget. You know, she had this opportunity that was so different from everything she'd ever done before. And she made a spreadsheet of the pros and cons and so forth. And one of her friends, Flatted his hand down his spreadsheet and said, do not even look at any of this. The only thing that is relevant is what is this company or organization going to do? Is it growing? Is it exciting? He said, if someone offers you a seat on a rocket ship, you don't say, what seat? You say, let me get on. And uh, that, that's what you've been offered here with this. And because the company or organization is going to burden, it's going to be new people at all times and do new and different things, your talents uh, will have more opportunity to grow than a uh, company that's an uh, organization that's static. And, and, and of course, I think that's advice for her pa personality type, probably my personality type, and, and those who, who enjoy dynamic, um, constantly changing environments. That's not all of us. So some of us might prefer a quiet uh, company or organization that stays the same in its 100-year history. But um, if, if growth and change is about you, that's her advice uh, about where to work. Um, all right, so let's, let's see. Okay. And this thing works very well. It works upside down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> so I moved in track of, okay, so we were, on, we were on the jungle gym, and now we're over to our tradition business. Um, so slaughter starts just by reminding us how valuable we are, those of us who are over 40. That, and I think this applies whether or not we actually took time out uh, to care for our children, uh, our parents, or anyone else. And wh whether you're sitting in this chair because you took a break and for caregiving and you want to go back, or you're sitting in this chair because you got laid off, or uh, fired, or didn't like your company and want to change, um, this point is still important. The fact that there are these women, the, the probably many of the same women that uh, Sandberg identified, who took a break and then had a hard time getting back in, um, is a reminder that that talent is valuable and that our society has this prejudice. And you know, we've, been, we've been reminded of this prejudice that doesn't necessarily change overnight, it's there. But I think it's important just for us to remember this, that a prominent public intellectual is helping to focus employers' attention on this kind of thing. And it's, it's true these things don't change overnight. There are companies that don't want to hear any of this. But all these conversations have to start somewhere. And then for us to own it, to 
that um, we left the workplace or we got booted out of the workplace, whatever the reason, we are a valuable resource. We have a lot of experience. And um, what she reminded us, too, that the experience we got out of the workplace doing other things, caring for children, parents, and others, is valuable to the work world uh, as well, and to stand up for that. Uh, what public you know, intellectual? I was just saying Anne Marie Slaughter is a public intellectual. Oh, so that's who you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, I'm referring to. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 That as a person who was the dean of the Rupert Wilson School of Public Policy at Princeton, um, was a high level um, deputy of whatever in the State Department, and now is the president of the New America um, Foundation think tank here in DC. And uh, I, I have some resources at the end. If you, know, you don't want to read the whole book, there are many speeches and um, articles and things you can read of providing the whole of these women. Uh, this is out there, and uh, there's a conversation about it, which doesn't mean it changes overnight, or it's not tough, but uh, I, I think this is an important point that someone like that's taking this on. Someone who was writing about foreign policy and international law and other things, that those were the most important things in her life before. Uh, some, but some personal things happened to her that changed her and made her take this on as her previous issue. Uh, I also love her uh, athletic metaphor. And she, she focuses uh, on athleticism in one, although I think it actually applies to the second thing she uh, talks about. Uh, so the, the, her, her main metaphor is interval training, that um, when you uh, get on a treadmill or an elliptical or whatever, you always find these programs for go with steady pace, and then for two minutes, go really fast, and then draw back. And then, you know, in that or in so many other kinds of sports training of pushing hard as hard as you can for a short time and then the city thing is, is good for our health and we want to study on that too. But that because our lives, uh, our life expectancy since we were today has, has grown so much, uh, we, we can think about planning these phases and hardly we can push our companies and organizations to think about these phases where people will go in and out where it will be normal um, to have phases or intervals in our increasingly uh, long lives. We think ahead to those. I think sometimes they happen through illness of family members, uh, crises that we can't predict, although she would urge us to never make a decision like that in a crisis uh, if we can think about these things in advance. And then also she, she draws our focus to portfolio careers, which I, I think that athletic metaphor is still there, but it's still like cost training. And, and it's, this is important to think about as you're changing career, you're looking for new jobs, that the thing you've done, you've done the most or the thing you've done the last is not your only skill. There are other things in your life or you may have been in a variety of different jobs. And um, it, it, she saw this phenomenon thing happening in the UK and then began to think about it in her own life, all the different roles she played. And uh, for her, it's always been full-time jobs. But for other people, it's putting together a portfolio of part-time jobs that add up to perhaps to full-time income, and then you can call together these pieces of your identity. And then just to keep it in your mind, you can think of this as a sports metaphor, too, because if you go out running 10 miles every day, you may fly at your knees, but uh, if you swim uh, alternately or, or use an elliptical machine or things, this works better for that. And then, the last, um, and, and, and extremely important to her book and to us also, I think at any age, is to support and build the sense of the need to be a men's movement. So she calls us to honor gender pioneers. So you know, who, should, who should talk about it? Uh, it? In a lot of ways, she seems to be thinking about younger men who are now at home with their children, men who are taking their uh, paternity leave if it's offered to them or taking time off without pay, um, men who are 50-50 fathers and husbands. And in the book, it's, it seems very focused on what young men are doing now. But I want to stand up and say, this is not just about young men. I married 37 years ago a man who took my middle name and has hung on to it all these years. Kurt Taylor Gobbass publishes books and articles with my name in the middle uh, as well and spoke up and corrected people. And 
was there for me at every step of the way. What was indeed a 50-50 father and more, 50-50 cook, learned to sew, learned to bake. Uh, it, you know, from his father, he learned all the carpentry and the plumbing and things. Like that. But, but from his mother, he learned these other things. And um, I, I want to say, gender pioneers among men are not just now. And I look back at my own father, who want to go a generation before that, who, who was born in 1930 and was product more of that era. But my mother never learned to drive. And because of that one simple thing. Even though um, he was at home for part of my childhood, my father drove to all the adults. You know, about your school weekend, you know, your Girl Scouts or any of, of those things. He was the one who did grocery shopping, and he had uh, been a typing teacher at one point. He taught me to type. I remember a scholarship competition in high school where I was up late typing it, and my father came down in his pajamas and offered to be my secretary so that I could uh, you know, finish the last part of this. Uh, you know, and as I thought about what to say to him at his memorial service, you know, so many of these memories came back to me. And you know, I know there are others who will remember men who were gender pioneers, not just now, but before too. And they may be more rare, but you know, it's one of the most important things that she has to say, that we need to honor these men and say their names. And, um, and when we talk about them, we need to use people language. So we, um, we say, working mothers. But how often do you ever hear anybody, and, and, and she got me on this too, because I've not been using this language. How often do you ever hear somebody say, working fathers? If, you know, if you're in a 40 hour week job, but you have a 15 year old, does somebody call you a working father? But if you're in that job with that 15 year old, they're gonna call you a working mother. And uh, she also calls us to think about terms like stay-at-home mom, or, you know, or what dads rarely do is stay-at-home dad, instead to call these folks full-time parents. Or uh, in, in her case, her husband has stepped up to the plate. It, it's such a huge view when she was at the State Department. Um, she called him the lead parent. Uh, so, so that we can think of uh, terminology that does not make it sound like only women do this, that it's not okay for women. And then uh, we want to ask our society to give men equal choices in caregiving so that it's not stigmatized. Uh, and it, you know, why, why did I come to a group over 40 and put on this list that it's not very many things? Make paternity the default so that you have to opt out of it rather than opt in the men, men that we want to call as a society, call our companies. Of course, we have too many companies that don't even give paid maternity leave to women now. And the, the lower down the income level, and um, where women of color are working more and more and more uh, jobs that don't include this, that's bad enough. But men have it even less. So as, as we look for what we aspire to, to uh, not only to give it to men, but to say it's normal. If you don't want this, you're going to have to tell us you don't want this, just like you don't want the retirement account or something like that. And I think that she didn't say that this was important for over 40, but I think this is over 40 important. Because if we have young women and men who come to feel that it's normal to leave the workplace when they give birth to a child, adopt a child, uh, bring in a foster child, any of these things, then we see men going in and out of the workplace at these times where we value family as just as important as work. And then when you need time off to care for your mother or you need time off to care for your father, uh, we don't look and say, ah, it's okay for you. But you're really not holding up your, um, your image of stick in the kind of companies that, that you pointed out where the ethos is just nobody does that or um, where you're talking about, you know, I'm here even if I'm having blood transfusions. So that's why I think it's really important that we just start to push towards these things. Um, here are, oh, oh, and we, where we, I, I said I had a list uh, just as we wrap up because we are at 11.15. Mm -hmm. um, I went back to a couple of newspaper articles um, that, that I just at random cut out as I saw them over the last six months or so. And it was an interesting list of companies that had popped up in the news that I'm sure I missed many, but Ikea, Hilton, Chobani, Starbucks, Netflix, Deloitte, and of course Facebook. These were all companies that were mentioned in just a couple of newspaper articles about um, companies that had 
expanded their leave policy, not just <coughs> parental leave and not just for women. So in some cases it was green leave, in some cases it was uh, paid family and medical leave, in some cases uh, for care. And um, of course, some of these are you know, our trendier um, Silicon Valley kind of companies. But Hilton, for instance, made a point of extending this leave uh, even to housekeepers and desk clerks and Starbucks to police and so forth. So, and of course, these are companies with very prominent public images. Um, but it's good to see a few stepping out in front. And I think this comes more when we say we want it. And um, we do have to be real about some people feel too vulnerable to ask for it, and some people are more vulnerable than others. But we're less vulnerable when we all exist. So, if you want to learn more about um, we in our unfinished business. Of course, you can read the books. There's many copies in the library, and they're out in paperback, and they can get them used through Amazon at this point easily. But you can also go to the website, um, weinin.org, to learn more about weinin circles of uh, women and men supporting themselves in the workplace, and Dan Bossy, the connection to the Dan Bossy um, movement is there on that site. Or if you just say, ah, I've only got a half an hour, I want to read a little bit about this, just Oh, the Wikipedia articles about either Cheryl Sander or Emily Slaughter, and on that, there'll be direct links to things like the TED Talks, commencement speeches, the Atlantic article, so forth if you want a smaller bit. And of course, the new book option be about resilience is out. I can get any questions or comments. Uh, oh, there's my contact information. Questions? Can we have a copy of the presentation? Kathy, can you do that? Sure. Yeah. Questions, a couple of questions. No? Okay. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you.